Pepe. Welcome, everybody, to Talking Donkey International and our new television series, Country Wisdom. Let's set the tone for this new series of ours. It's found in Proverbs 4. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet and then all your ways will be sure. Join us now for Country Wisdom. They say ma. Ma, huh? <laughs> Ma. Ma. You know, I knew that uh, you raised sheep, but I didn't know how sweet they were. Well, these are Jacob's sheep, and they're really special. I used to eat them, Jim, but I don't eat them anymore. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I've got to ask you, I know. What, what happened? It looked like uh, somebody hit you or something. Well, I ate a lot of candy when I was a kid and uh, wrecked my teeth, and uh, they did a lateral sinus lift and put two implants in. They had to raise the, the bone height so that I could, and I'm a little swollen, but it's getting better. Oh, well, you're looking pretty good. <laughs> hey, I want to introduce you to somebody here. Sure. Janice, I know you're probably going to pay attention to <laughs> oh, the baby and not my goodness. this is Dr. Elloway. <laughs> Hi. Janice Nelson. Hi. <laughs> nice to meet you. Isn't this a sweetheart? Oh, I want to take him home. You can see how Jesus made so many references to sheep, you know, they're just so yeah. sweet. I want to cuddle them. Yeah, and my sheep know my voice. I can call them from the other end of the field. Really? Yeah. Wow. They'll, they'll come they'll around come, to yeah, you. Yeah. My pups That's don't awesome. even obey like that. <laughs> well, well, I could spend all day with this little guy. Matter of fact, I could take one home, but I want to hear the rest of your story. I'm sure Janice does too, so right. let's he's been, go find He's her. told me a little bit, but not nearly enough. Mm -hmm. I want to hear it all. Let's, let's find a shady place. Let's, huh? let's do it. I love this place. The views and everything are beautiful. Yeah, this place, it's just green and there's birds and flowers and I am really struggling to not be breaking one of the commandments about coveting <laughs> what I wouldn't give for this deck especially all these trees it's just I wouldn't get anything done I'd be sitting on a bench all day but you know we could probably be looking at this all day long but you've got an incredible story to tell and we want to get right to it share with take a big breath and share with us <laughs> well it all started when I was younger my dad uh, was interested in thoroughbred horses and as a hobby he was a dentist but on a hobby he wanted some I guess some action in his life and he invested in these thoroughbred horses and of course he liked to race them and we had some winners and uh, at a young age That's I learned an expensive hobby expensive hobby there's jockeys there's trainers and uh, and so we would go to this Vancouver Exhibition Racetrack in British Columbia, Canada. That's where I grew up. And uh, I can remember at a very young age uh, eating in the clubhouse. And then, of course, you'd want to place a bet on your, your horse. Now, how young were you? Oh, my goodness. Uh, at 12 years old, they would allow gambling. You could, <laughs> you, could, you could place a bet for your dad at 12 years old. So you always told him it was for your dad, was it? Uh, well, at first. At first it was, and then I realized, you know what, I could, I could, maybe I could do this because you watch the horses go around the track and all you had to do is pick a winner and it only had to come in first, second, or third and for a $2 bet, you could end up with three or four or five dollars and that was enough to buy a hamburger, a hot dog, a milkshake and two chocolate bars, you know, in, in those days. And uh, so it was, it was a hook at a very young age that got it, that, now you were you were a Christian family at that time, or? Yes, we were a Christian family. We attended church. You know, my dad would would attend periodically. My mom was faithful, uh, very faithful. But this was my dad. You know, he wanted, he had this little side thing going on, and uh, uh, it was. And did he have any idea that you were gambling? Well, he gambled. Okay, so he he would bet on his horse as well. You know, so. Um, it was, you know, some of these things maybe aren't, uh, as you're growing up, aren't weighed in different homes as much as other homes, but. And I'm sure he never thought it would be a problem. It was just something that was fun yeah, for an right. afternoon. Correct. And it revolved around uh, outside, of, outside of the home and an event, an exciting event, you know, seeing if your horse could win, whatnot. So where's this uh, little bit of a gambling addiction go? 
So yeah, so it started there, and then I, and I had another friend who introduced me to roulette and, and blackjack, and Vancouver, being a port city, they brought in you know, some gambling, and so we would you know, go to these uh, places where you could play the cards. And How old were you by this time? Now I'm a, I'm a teenager, uh, high school. How'd you get into the... I know, I was just yeah. thinking you could go in and play roulette. So, so at 18, I think, 18, 19, 18, 19, you could, you could, uh, you could, you could play. <laughs> but were you playing before that? Uh, well, you, I, I don't think. <laughs> That's a yes. Don't no, no, I was on the yes. spot. <laughs> <laughs> so mostly it was the racetrack okay. until, until I got, I got a little bit older and so in college. So you played the racetrack all the time, kind of through. Yeah, when I could. I mean, I didn't have it when I'd go with my dad. And then when I got my driver's license, I found myself uh, going there. Okay. Now, you skipped through this part a little bit, but. What was your, quote, Christian experience during this time? Well, my Christian experience was, uh, you know, it's difficult to answer because, you know, you've got one foot in the world and, and, and one foot doing that. But, you know, I, I love the Lord. I, I would read my Bible and I would have family worship and things like that. So the outsider wouldn't, wouldn't have had a clue that you know, that this was going on. And for probably most of the family, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people who go to church and they do things, they come on s Sabbath morning and uh, have no idea what's going on in their life. That's really what you, why you decided to share your testimony today, right? Is because you can be sitting in the church pew and you can look nice and you, you know, you're a doctor, you've got an upstanding business in the community and everything, Christian, but there's other things going on. Um, let's just kind of continue. Um, what happened after the teenage years? So I uh, attended college, and of course in college you're pretty busy, but I still make you know, expeditions to go and find a time to do that. And in fact, right up until, uh, 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 right into dental school, I was, would go to, because we went to Loma Linda, and I would take a little time to go to uh, Las Vegas. Christian Dental School. Yeah, Christian Dental <laughs> School. And, and what was exciting, well, I didn't have much money to lose at that time. I had, you know, barely anything, but I made friends with the pit boss and, and uh, he would put me in a room for free and, uh, and give me a free meal. And, and we'd stay there for the weekend and, and have a good time and wouldn't lose much money or we might make a little money. It just, it was, it was a horrible... You said we would, would stay, stay so you had friends who'd go with you yeah, too? Yeah, sometimes I'd have friends, yeah, that would, that would uh, come. I can imagine that part of the allure is that hit of adrenaline because you might, you know, you might win. And I'm sure when you do win, I'm talking from imagination here. Right, okay. It just hasn't been something I'm tempted to spend money on, but you take me to a shoe store or a bookstore and all bets are off. But was that part of it? It's like every time you're thinking, I, I might win. Yeah, so of course a gambler always thinks he's gonna win. And when you win, it's exciting, but you find yourself, it's actually slavery. You're staying up all night, all hours, you, you don't even want to go to the bathroom when you're winning because... But you still managed to get through dental school? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's an addiction. And uh, it's, a, it's, a cherished, it's a cherished sin that some people might have that, that I'd like to reach out to today because uh, they don't understand that, that, you know, just like there's a Holy Spirit, there's an unholy spirit. And when you start realizing that Satan controls, that's his playground, and he can control the cards, he can make you win, he can make you lose, that's not a nice game to be in. You use the word slavery. Yes. Would you unpack that just a little bit more? Slavery, well, you know, the children of Israel, <laughs> they were in slavery, and Moses went in there to get them out so they could start keeping the Sabbath and start living the abundant life that Jesus promises. And I probably missed out on the abundant life when I was in that sort of situation. But I'm sure I did. But you thought you were having a good life. I thought I was, right? It's a big lie. But you weren't really in control. Well, no. I mean, when you're, when you're feeling like you're going to win all the time and that you have to take your own money and then you end up losing it and then sometimes you win and most of the time you lose. Uh, if, if Las Vegas made 10 cents on every person that went in there, they would go bankrupt. So obviously everybody's losing. Um, now you... Um... You're in college, 
I understand at some point in time, I know you got married, I've met your wonderful wife. Yeah, she's um, a blessing to me. Did she know what was going on? Yeah, she's aware of it, but uh, I, I, uh, what's the word? Um, won her heart. <laughs> okay, thought she had a good catch. <laughs> she recognized your potential. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, and uh, you come from a really good family and that her father, um, uh, man of God, who, you know, prayed for us and our future and, and uh, thankful for that. I, you know, marrying into a good family makes a big difference. So this continued on. Uh, you didn't stop, put the brakes on when you got married. Yeah, but it, it significantly slowed down, and, and, and my wife, Nora, never really uh, wanted anything to do with it. You know, she'd always uh, be hesitant to, to allow me to do it, but then I would do it occasionally, secretly, and so I'd get a call, where are you? And I'd go, well, you know, I didn't want to lie to her, and so I'd say, well, I, you know, just finished playing hockey, and then I would end up uh, stopping off at the little card shop where nobody knew I would, was there. I used to be a drug dealer, an alcoholic, and a thief, along with far too many other things to mention. You know, I kidded myself that I was great, life was great, but knowing there was a massive void in my life, I'd like to offer you a pamphlet called Breaking Addictions. You know, addictions come in all types, shapes, and sizes, but you don't need to be chained to them any longer. Go to TalkingDonkeyInternational.org and order your free copy today. Request Offer 101 breaking addictions. Remember, it's completely free. Introducing Talking Donkey International. God once used a donkey to spread his word, but he'd rather use all of us. It's time to prepare quality programming created to attract and reach viewers of the world, not just those of our denomination. Together, we can carry the final Advent message to the individuals of planet Earth and hasten the return of our Lord. Please pray for and support the successful mission of Talking Donkey International. I've had the opportunity to know you for many years. Of course, I guess I didn't totally know you because you sprang this on me more recently. <laughs> but I can remember finding you one time and said, Randall, you need to come with me on a mission trip. And you said, oh, Jim, I, I just can't afford to do that. Just can't afford to do that. And I remember saying, well, why don't you pray about it? And, you know, kind of how do you refuse as a church member? How do, no, I'm not going to pray about it. But you did. And, and He roped me in on my first mission trip, same way. <laughs> <laughs> Would you kind of pick up on that story and what God did through there for you? Yeah, there was a time where we were coming to your church. And it wasn't just one time, Jim, you invited me. I think you invited me. You were very persistent. I think you invited me three or four times. And... And the big deal was I couldn't leave my practice for three weeks because you can't just shut things down for the rest. There's no way I financially could do that. And, but finally, with your persistence, and uh, I did say I would go. And it's funny, the minute I said I, I would go, um, I started getting these big cases, bridge cases and implant cases. And, and uh, my office was so busy. And the day before I left, I looked at the bottom line and I had, I had enough money to pay for three weeks of vacation slash mission work and, uh, and God provided. And so that was evidence to me that he really wanted me to go. And that was life changing, not only for me, but for my, my daughter, Natasha, who's now in dental school, by the way, <laughs> doesn't gamble. <laughs> I, I, remember, I remember you called me up and said, Jim, you'll never guess what happened to me in my practice. I remember saying, yes, I would, but go ahead and tell me anyway. <laughs> And, and you shared this story. Yeah. But you went on the mission trip. Tell us a little bit about that trip. It was a great trip. Uh, we ministered to the people there and saw so many uh, needy cases. And uh, what I remember the most is it, I'm really happy that my youngest went. Was she like eight years old at the time? And she was sterilizing and it was life changing for her. But, uh, you know, probably. I, 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 there's so many things, Jim, I could talk about that trip, but uh, it was, it was, but at this time, you know, I, I don't remember if I was gambling, I was closer to the Lord then, but, you know, things like this can kind of creep up on you. They go away for a while and they creep up on you, but, uh, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seemed like you were having this real conflict in your heart and in your mind that I want to go gamble but now I'm doing mission trips and God's speaking to my heart. I mean, what was going on? 
Boy, that's a lukewarm state, isn't it? Not a place, almost like, you know, you, it's frightful when you, when mm -hmm. described, it describes people today. You know, one foot in the church and one foot out of the church. So, you know, I came across this, um, con this my, one of my favorite authors says that one cherished sin can, if you don't overcome it, let me get the right exact context to that. It says here, uh, even one wrong trait of character, one sinful desire pr persistently cherished will eventually neutralize all the power of the gospel. So it's like a couple cells of a cancer that gets into the body and just keeps growing. Yeah, and, and all God's love and mercy and, and him being the savior, understanding all of that is neutralized. If you cherish, you're not willing to, to give it up. So there's this battle, this great controversy going on in my own life. And uh, So what was the turning point? Well, it's, 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 it's interesting. Uh, the turning point was um, I showed up to church one. Well, I, I went to a dental meeting in, in uh, Reading and went to the casino and played for about an hour after the meeting. Didn't think anybody saw me and went to church that Sabbath. Uh, this was a Friday and the next day was Sabbath and went to church and I found a note on my car <laughs> and the note said, we saw you and we don't think this is appropriate uh, for an elder. I was an elder. This was uh, uh, quite a few years ago, maybe Which is nine, out here, so nine or nine years ago or something like that. You keep the Sabbath, so you're a Seventh-day Adventist <laughs> and an elder, you're, you're one of the local leaders of the church. Yeah, that, that's very, very uh, bad almost. So uh, I see this note and it says, we saw you and uh, we don't think that's appropriate. And, and I, uh, I said, okay, you know, who wrote this note? There's no sign, no, nobody came up to me, nobody approached me. For all I know, an angel put that there. Okay, I really, to this day, I don't know who put that note there. So this started the wheels turning. You know what? I've got a double life. And even though I'm not doing this all the time, it's still something that somebody recognized as, as something that's not proper for an elder, a church to be doing. And none of us are perfect, Jim. And, uh, but, but, you know, this, these open sins, you know, uh, the gambler, the, the drunkard's often despised, uh, the, the gambler's despised, but the pride, covetousness, and selfishness go unrebuked. This was an open sin that I felt a lot of shame. If I can take you back to that moment, again, when you picked up that note and read that. Yeah. What went through your mind? I was found out. Somebody knows, you know, I can't hide this anymore. This is my church, someone at my church knows. So this is like, this is not good, you know, I can't. I, I've, I've got to tell you, I, I can't help but think about in uh, some of the African nations, you know, the witch doctors and things, people go to the witch doctor and they, the witch doctor tells them, go do this, you know, and it's in the secret of the night. But then the witch doctor tells somebody else. That's the way the devil is. You know, he, he wants to make the life of everybody absolutely miserable. So he gets you to do something, then he tells somebody else that you're doing it. And, and that was, it was making your life miserable, really. Well, it was, actually, I'm thankful for that note because it was, a, it was I think, the icing on the cake, the turning point um, to realize that I, I, I need to do something about this. It, I can't let this go on. So. Um, I went to camp meeting and uh, they were talking about getting anointed for sickness. And, you know, I, James talks about this, if any of you are sick. And, you know, sickness doesn't necessarily have to be cancer or, or heart disease or, you know, AIDS or whatever. Um, and in my mind, gambling can be a, is a sickness and it was a cherished sin. Uh, and so I uh, wanted to be anointed and I didn't want to do it at camp meeting. So I came back and I explained to my pastors that I trusted Whoa. and I sat them down, I have two pastors that I trusted and I sat them down and I explained to them about the note. I explained to them about the, that I wanted to be anointed and I wanted to be done with this. So. And their response was? Oh, they were happy. Had they ever been asked to anoint someone for something like that? I don't think so. I don't think so. And there's power in anointing. And uh, so if anybody out there is doing, you know, something there, this is, this is key, I think, uh, the Holy Spirit. So they, you know, we knelt down and, and, uh, I, and they, I asked for a double portion. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. uh, and the true test um, was just actually, I think, six months ago, we had another dental meeting. 
you know, I hadn't been to Las Vegas in years. And this anointing took place maybe eight years ago. And uh, I haven't gambled since. Amen. Praise God, you know. Um, what do you attribute that to? Oh, it's, it, there's only one thing it could be attributed to, and it's the power of God. There's no question about it, it was his mercy. And because you couldn't have just stopped no, on your own. No, I, I, I don't think so. Um, because it, the, true, you know, the true test, again, was going to Las Vegas and, uh, and, and being in that situation. I said, okay, I went there. I purposed in my heart. You know, Daniel purposed. I purposed in my heart before I went because we didn't really want to go there, but it was a meeting we had to go to. It was an implant meeting. And, and so we went because that was where it was offered. And um, I hate the place. You know, I don't even want to be there, but the, the meeting was there. So that's why we were there. And uh, the first day was no problem, you know. Second day, I think we were there three nights. And the second day was, you know, the little, the little voice uh, started to say, you know, just go play a little bit. And I went downstairs, I kind of looked, and ah, that's okay. And the, the, third, the third day, uh, the day we were leaving, that was the day. That morning I got up and said, I told my wife, you know, I really want to play. I, I just want to just try a little bit. The devil really poured it on you. He did. He just, just, and, and so she says, no, you know, I thank God for a good, good wife. And, uh, and I says, yeah, I don't want to, but I want to, you know, I'm having that, that uh, we're here, you know, and we're leaving today, you know, how, you know, trying to justify it. Put a few quarters of Yeah, the just, you know, and <laughs> whatever. And uh, I went outside the hotel we were staying at. I think it was Bellagio or was it the Bellagio? I think it was the Bellagio Hotel. Outside they have this statue and it's this awful looking dragon and his name is Karin. And I looked up what Karin was. And it said, um, God of money or, or, or luck or something like that, I, I can't remember. And I was like, this is not, this is not good. And, and, and at that point, again, I just said, thank you, Lord, for deliverance of this. And uh, when I got on the plane, it wasn't until I got on, because at the airport, they got slot machines and gambling. Oh, they have it everywhere, everywhere. at the restroom. And, <laughs> uh, and, and so I got on the plane, and it wasn't until I was on the plane, I looked out the window, and I looked at, let's call it Sodom and Gomorrah, and I looked at it, and I, we were taken off, and I just started crying. I said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for giving me the victory over this. Not one penny, not one nickel was spent there. And uh, it's because of his power and his love. Describe for me, if you would, Dr. Elloway's life now versus Dr. Elloway's <laughs> life then, and how it's affected your family and your church and practice, everything. Well, there's more, there's more power in, uh, and more validity and uh, uh, and what I, I say, because now I, 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 I know that, that, I mean, I'm handing out, I'm talking all day long about God now. I mean, I did before, but I can, I can feel, I, uh, you know, when you, when you have been this way and then that way, uh, I guess the best way to say it is uh, you have a more of a, you have a walk. You know how Enoch walked with God? I wasn't walking all the time. I would walk and then I would fall and I'd walk and I'd fall. I mean, I'm still going to probably still fall. And in the minute you overcome something, there's the, the Holy Spirit reveals more things in your life. <laughs> so it's like, now I got to work on this, this and this. And, and so there, it's, it's an ongoing, ongoing sanctification is the work of a lifetime. And I haven't arrived. I just overcome something that was nagging me and eating away at me like a cancer, like you said. And uh, to get victory over that is huge. Um, for my family, um, you know, they really didn't, they really didn't know too much. I kept it from them. My wife knew, but my kids, you want to set a good example for them, so they didn't really know. But I, you can talk about these things when you know that God's given you victory over them, and we try to hide, we try to hide our, try to hide our problems uh, from, from, from people. And, and, you know, it says, confess your sins one to another. And there's power in that. It doesn't mean that people are going to forgive you. Only God can forgive sins. But when you confess, trust with, you know, confess, there's some power in that because people can pray for you. The righteous prayer, I mean, the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And uh, so keep praying for me, Jim. I'm, uh, God's not done with me yet. Amen. <laughs> with any of us. I think, though, when you are forced and you finally recognize just how weak you are, mm. and I, it makes you much more empathetic to people whether they have the same problem you do or something different, because it is literally there, but for the grace of God. You know, I've, I've been down too, maybe with a different problem, but we all have those issues. And I found that being more honest about them rather than pretending, yeah. you know, oh, I, I'm fairly perfect. You know, 
Well, first of all, my family wouldn't believe it. But you find that other people then have the courage to come and say, you know, I've struggled with that same thing. People who would never have opened up, would never have found, you know, the strength in numbers, the, the Christian fellowship, when you're not being honest. But when you recognize, oh, I'm not the only one that that has this this secret, mm. you know, somebody else has overcome it. It gives you courage. Which brings me to a point. We've probably only got a minute or two left, but what would you tell viewers? A lot of the same things are going through their minds. They might be in that old position right now. What would you tell them? Go on a mission trip. <laughs> uh, you know, it really boils down f to being honest with yourself and with other people. Uh, it's a slavery to live two lives. It's a lie. And you're not going to be happy and you're not going to be fully effective or f fully used by the Holy Spirit until you can um, have that victory of that cherished sin. We all sin, but there's those cherished ones, those loved ones, those, those ones that you just don't want to let go of. And this was one of them. This is not something that I did every day, but it was that one I really liked. Just a game, you know, it's, you know I, I'm going to win some money. Uh, the excitement, you look around, you know, and it's flashing and dress up, uh, devil's playground. And, and so for those that uh, perhaps might be uh, having this struggle, if you really want to, you know, uh, my, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and they know my voice. And Jesus, I could recognize his voice calling me um, and, uh, and he wants, he promises the abundant life. And that certainly wasn't it, Jim. The, the abundant life is, 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 is a life with Jesus. And that's, and I can't wait to see what he's got planned Amen. for us Amen. In, in the new heaven and the new earth. Randall, I want to thank you, brother, for a wonderful testimony. And folks, I want to talk to you just for a second here. You heard what God has done in this young man's life. Changed his life, changed his family, changed the direction of eternity for him. Because as he said, he didn't have eternity at the moment because this sin was dragging him and eating at him down and down and down. So please, give your life to Jesus Christ. Celebrate victory in Jesus Christ. It's yours for the asking and for the taking. I used to be a drug dealer, an alcoholic, and a thief, along with far too many other things to mention. You know, I kidded myself that I was great, life was great, but knowing there was a massive void in my life. I'd like to offer you a pamphlet called Breaking Addictions. You know, addictions come in all types, shapes, and sizes, but you don't need to be chained to them any longer. Go to TalkingDonkeyInternational.org and order your free copy today. Request offer 101, Breaking Addictions. Remember, it's completely free. Hey, thanks for joining us for Country Wisdom. See you next time. <laughs>